In the summer of the year 1888, in the bustling city of London, there was unbeknownst to the civilians, one of the most notorious sailor killers to ever roam the earth. In the east side of London, there's a district known as Whitechapel. Whitechapel was known for its overcrowded slums, and police would look around the dimly lit alleys, streets, and courtyards. At 4.44 a.m. of the August 7th, in a passage known as George Yard, they would find something very much different. An upstairs tenant named John Reeves stumbled onto the body of a woman lying on her back in a pool of blood. Constable Thomas Barrett was the first to arrive to the scene. He was joined by Dr. Timothy Killeen, who over a quick inspection said she was stabbed 39 times in the chest and abdomen. The doctor estimated to be dead around three hours, marking the time of death around 2.30 in the morning. What was strange about the killing that was whenever asked, no tenants have heard a scream or cry for help. But there was one exception. Her name was Amy Hughes, a tenant who claimed to hear one crime murder, but this was earlier in the night of August 6th, not at 2.30 the next day. The victim was later identified as 39-year-old Martha Tavern. She was a mother of two and divorced many years prior. Her residency was 19 George Street, and that was less than 300 meters from her death site. She made her living from prostitution, and one of her associates, Mary Ann Connolly, testified that on the night of the August 6th, her and Martha went drinking with two soldiers. Right before, the, right before midnight, the party force split, and the last time Martha was seen alive. On the morning of August 31st, Robert Paul crossed the street to go to work. After making a right turn onto Buck's Row, he spotted a man standing there in the middle of the road. He was looking at a woman's dead body right there, and the man's name was Charles Cross. At 3.40 a.m., the two men walked closely to the body, and one reached their hand out, and the hands were cold to the touch. Cross truly believed that the woman was dead, but Paul thought he could sense the faint breathing instead. Instead of calling for help, the two were worried about getting to work. Thankfully, Constable John Neal was around the corner and was informed when John Neal went to investigate, he found one big cut in the neck and it was still bleeding and some, bar some parts of her body was still warm. He was soon joined by Constable John Thane, who was sent to go find a doctor shortly after his arrival, Dr. Rees Lee Wellen, estimated she had not been dead for more than half an hour. That means that Paul and Cross had found the body near minutes after she had died. When she was delivered to the morgue, the other two cuts in her throat. Dr. John Sparling said she was disemboweled. Dr. Reese Lee Wellen also included that the killer had some rough anatomical knowledge. The victim was quickly identified as Mary Ann Nichols. She she turned 34 years old, just five days prior. Nichols had at least six children, and her last known residence was at 54 Flowers in Dean Street. Nichols, as well as the last victim, made a living off of prostitution. The, the last she was seen alive was by her friend on Whitechapel Road. Visibly drunk, barely one hour later, she was found dead. Apart from the body, there was no evidence, not a blood trail, no murder weapon, and not one witness. Investigator Joseph Helson the lead investigator of the case stated that quote not an atom of evidence can be attained to connect any one person to the crime but similarities between the two killings did not go unnoticed the needless brutality of the killings and there was no clear motive both victims were in the same profession and around the same age and in the same social class the only main difference was the injuries given Tabram was repeatedly stabbed while Nichols was slashed. That aside, the prevailing assumptions was that the killings were done by the same person, a feeling that would only grow stronger as time went on. On September the 8th, a man named John Richardson was on his way to work. At a quarter to five, he made a quick stop and in the back step before grabbing his knife to trim a piece of leather from his boot. Once he was done, he left about one hour later a third floor tenant, John Davis. When Davis went down to go to the backyard, there was a dead woman lying on her back. Inspector Joseph Chandler was the first there. At around 6.10, Dr. George Phillips followed. 20 minutes later, 
and found the woman terribly mutilated. The throat was deeply cut, the abdomen laid open, and the intestines were torn out and placed on her shoulder. Under the body of the woman, there were three things perfectly laid, and two brass rings were ripped off her left hand and that were missing. The doctor said that the, kill, the killing, the killer had some anatomical knowledge, because there was no meaningless, there was no meaningless cuts. So no mere slaughter of animals could have carried out the killing. It must have been someone that worked in a postmortem room. Later that day, the body was identified as Annie Chapman. The exact age is hard to tell. But around 27 years old, and at least seven children, and one ex-husband. Unlike the other two cases, there may have been a witness to the killing. Elizabeth Long, she was walking by, and it was certain she saw Annie Chapman, but there was a man who had his back turned to Miss Long, so she could not see who it was. The doctor estimated her time of death to be around 4.30, and according to Long, she saw Chapman around 5.30, and at 4.45, when Richardson was in the backyard, he did not see a body. Even more was Albert Kadosh, who was at 5.30, went for a walk in the backyard. When he heard voices, he could not make out what they were saying, but he could only make out one word, and that was the word no. Real way, there is no real way to untangle this weird timeline, but Dr. Phillips said he may have been wrong and he may have miscalculated the time of death. That would still place the time of death around 5.30, and even with several of the tenant's windows open, the killer still evaded detection. On September the 29th, a meeting was held at the Socialist Club on Forter Bruner Street. When the meeting came to an end around midnight, only a few stayed. Those who stayed drank and socialized. Half an hour later, Joseph Lave stepped outside to get, a fresh, get a, some fresh air. Moments later, a man named Morris Eagle came in as well and was a member of the club. A few minutes later, a carriage was heard and the driver, Louis Deemschrute, was the steward of the clubhouse. When he turned into the alley, his horse was turning to the left, so he took so he looked to the right. Lying there, he could have sworn he saw a figure. So he stepped down and shined a light on shined a light down. He found a woman lying on her side around 1 a.m. When she was alerted when when the when the club was alerted, a small group came outside and there were very and a few that could see the woman's throat was clear was fearfully cut when a group went to go find a policeman across the city less than a kilometer to the west. In an even more fearful discovery was about to be made. Around 1.30 a.m., Constable Edwards Watkins was patrolling a place called Miter Square. Around 1.44 a.m., he found a body. He was not there just 30 minutes prior, but now there was a body. Her throat was slit and her bowels protruding, Dr. Dr. George Sequeer and Dr. Frederick Brown were there, and back in Bruner Street, Dr. Frederick Blackwell and Dr. George Phillips arrived. But she did not have any cuts to the abdomen, unlike the other victims. The other two killing were only separated by the, the two killings were only separated by 900 meters. Inside 45 minutes, this rose some suspicion that the two murders were carried out by the same person. But. But this must be said that it is pure speculation. There is no evidence to suggest it is the same person. And Dutchfield's yard was identified as a 44-year-old. And Dutchfield's yard was identified as a 44-year-old Elizabeth Stride. When the last time Stride was seen alive, she was thrown to the floor. When, when, when a witness tried to pass, a man yelled Lipsky, and a pipe-smoking man started to follow him. But Inspector Frederick A. Birnler. One of the lead investigators on the case stated that a man named Israel Lipsky was convicted of murder and that case made the surname Lipsky had become an anti-symmetric slur. Aberline therefore deducted that the man who shot Lipsky was insulting Schwartz. And the man with the pipe was also frightened and walked away. If, in, if the inspector is right, it, it seems doubtful. We may never know for sure. In the other murder case, a postmortem revealed that there was missing. 
there was missing organs, one of those being her left kidney, and those presumed to be taken by the killer. According to Dr. Frederick Brown, this would make a good deal of knowledge. But on the other hand, Dr. George Sequeer said that a killer did not have great anatomical knowledge. The woman in Mitre Square was identified as 46-year-old Catherine Eddowes. She had at least five children, and escaping her abusive husband, she became estranged from her family. Earlier that night, she had gotten drunk and detained at, tw at 20.30 and was locked in a cell until 1 a.m. Then at 1.35, three people walked into Mitre Square and only one paid attention to the couple, and his name was Joseph Laundry. He said that the man she was with looked like a sailor and had a reddish handkerchief. Laundry didn't identify the woman as Cat did identify the woman as Catherine Eddowes. He never saw her face, though. This made this the, he saw them only ten minutes be before the body was found. What is so tragic about the case is that the killer was so close to being captured across the street, there was a policeman and his family sleeping. Right next to that, there is a watchman who is a retired policeman cleaning, an earshot from the site. Yet he had not heard anything at the time of the murder. Last, Constable James Harvey had glanced into Mitre Square only four minutes prior to the body's discovery. Harvey would have an unobstructed view into the murder site, but saw nothing suspicious but the killer escaped without a trace. Just before three, a bloody piece of cloth was found and it was identified to be ripped portion of the apron worn by Eddowes. Just above the cloth, there was writing that said, Junes are the men that will be blamed for nothing. The meaning nor Arthur, the meaning nor Arthur remain in doubt. It was written, was it written by the killer? Was it supposed to cast suspicion towards the Jewish community? was completely unrelated to the murder. Three days before the murder, Elizabeth and Stride, Elizabeth Stride and Catherine Eddowes, the Central News Agency received a letter. The author of this letter claimed responsibility for the recent murders and planned for the next job after the two killings. The same agency received another postcard, but this one was blood smeared and it contained detail about the two killings and the author described it as a double event. The police had made the two letters public and hoped that someone recognized the handwriting, but no one could. But public pub publicity of the letters only to advertise the name that was signed, Jack the Ripper. The authenticity of the two letters are questioned to this day, but most notably, one of the letters promised to clip the lady's ear off and send it to the police. The police never received such a package like that, and none of the two victims were missing their ears. Modern lin linguistic analysis have suggested that they were written. They were, does suggest that they were written by the same person. So fake or not, are the same Arthur author had wrote had wrote put, had wrote all the letters written, and no. And after the letters went public. There was letters pouring into police station claiming to be the killer. But one of them seemed to maybe have been genuine. It was a box and a letter sent on October 16th to a man, George, to a man. The man it was sent to was the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee, a small group of local men that hunted the identity of the killer. The package contained a letter and half a kidney. Doctors who had examined the kidney all agreed it was a human kidney. But was it the same left kidney from the body of Eddowes? It could not be determined. It could have been a sick hoax by a medical student, or a popular theory that is still today was that some of the letters had been fabricated by the press. But there had been no evidence and there had been no and there was no killings for that rest of that month that barred the markings of the river. Maybe, perhaps, it was finally over. On November the 9th, a merchant and property owner, John McCarthy, was going through his bookkeeping. McCarthy was the landowner of Miller's Court, 
and the tenant of room 13 had fallen behind on their rent. McCarthy sent over his assistant, Thomas Boyer, to collect the money at a quarter to eleven. After knocking twice with no response, Boyer went to the window to peer through to peer in, but his view was obstructed by a curtain, so Boyer had to reach inside the wind the broken window to pull it aside. And there, once he pulled the curtain aside, was was a severely mutilated body of a woman. But whenever the police arrived, room thirteen had was locked, and they had to pry it open with a pickaxe. But when they opened the door, they they said it's something they would see in their nightmares. Dr. George Phillips described the body as cut up into pieces. Dr. Thomas Bond had described the woman's body to be hacked beyond recognition. The body had been monstrously disfigured, with organs dispersed all around the room. Itself had one. The room itself had one room, two tables, or one or two chairs, a small cabinet. Amongst the ashes of a fireplace, the police found patches of clothing burned. Was it the killer trying to disperse of evidence, or was it merely just for light and warmth? The victim was identified very quickly as Mary Jane Kelly. But almost everything in her life was a mystery. She was presumed to be in her mid-twenties, but no records of a Mary Jane Kelly matched. She was probably using a fake identity, but Kelly had not been living alone. Until a few days prior, she was living with a man named Joseph Barnett. They only separated on October the 30th because Barnett's disapproval of Kelly's prostitution. And the people who was have the people who were associated with. But on the evening of the 9th, Barnett paid Kelly a visit. When he arrived, he found Kelly in the company of a woman who was just about to leave. But there was not one name for this woman. There was not one name for this woman, or when he arrived at the residence, or how long he stayed. If we believe Barnett, he arrived at seven and a quarter to eight, and left before nine. Shortly before midnight, Kelly was seen with a man by her neighbor, Mary Ann Cox. But when Co- but when Cox passed Kelly, wished Kelly good night. Kelly was very much intoxicated, stated Cox. She could hear Kelly singing when she left one hour later. Kelly was still singing by two o'clock. Apparently, ventured whenever she apparently ventured back outside. She was spotted by a name George Hutchinson. The two of them were supposedly well acquainted, but Kelly asked if he could spare a coin. But Hutchinson was broke, and Kelly was desperate for money. Moments later, Hutchinson observed Kelly talking to a very well-dressed man. Hutchinson found out found it very suspicious that a, such a well-dressed man would be seen in the company of a woman like Kelly. So when when they started walking north, he followed. Whenever, he, whenever the man got close enough, Hutchinson observed him very closely. He saw a pair of gloves in his right hand and a small parcel in his left, then continued to follow. As they proceeded in Mil- into Miller's court before they vanished up the court, the man handed Kelly a red handkerchief. Huntington stayed there until 3 a.m., but neither Kelly or the man reappeared. At roughly the same time, Cox returned home, but whenever Cox pre- passed the room, there was no light or sound from in the room. At, a fo- at approximately 4 a.m., a tenant above and across Kelly's room heard cries of murder. Meanwhile, tenants have heard- Meanwhile, the other tenants heard nothing. According to Dr. Thomas Bond Kelly, she had died around 1.30 to 2 in the morning. Dr. George Phillips placed the time of death a few hours later. But some witnesses were adamant they have seen or even spoke to Kelly as late as 8 or 10 in the morning. Keep in mind, her body was found at a quarter to 11, but the precise time of death eludes, up, eludes us up to this day. Mary Ann Nichols, Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride, Catherine Eddowes, Mary Jane Kelly are known as the canonical five, the five most likely to be killed by the Ripper. Martha Tavern is sometimes included, but that is still divided, as well as a handful of other cases. Even the canonical five aren't without question, so the total number of killings are unknown and up to debate. Presuming that Kelly was indeed the final victim, one would have to wonder why did the killings come up to such an abrupt end? Now, it is time for the most controversial subject, the suspects of the murders. 
Some may argue that, that there are multiple suspects, but there's three main ones that I will talk about now. On the morning of the 31st, Charles Cross left his home on, Dove, on Doveton Street to go and work. When he, turned to, when he turned onto Buck's Row, he stumbled onto the body of Marianne Nichols. Moments later, he was joined by Robert Paul, and events transpired as previously stated. Even though he was so close to the crime, Cross had escaped suspicion from both the press and the police. He was seen as an innocent passerby as he, as he appeared. But however, in recent years, the perception has been under consideration. Some say... Cross was in the act of murdering Nichols before hearing Paul's footsteps drawing near. Cross was unable to escape, so he concealed the murder weapon and played the act of an instant passerby. It would make sense because the injuries seemed like they were interrupted, as they were less severe than those of the later victims. What was even more interesting is that Cross likely testified under a fake name, because he claimed to be a car man and live at 22 Doctrine Street, but later records say that the address was occupied by a Charles Leechmere. Leechmere was also employed as a car man, and at least one more occasion went by the name Charles Cross, as it was his stepfather's surname. It was assumed that Leechmere testified and used his stepfather's name, but the reason behind him using that name is under speculation. Was he trying to conceal his identity, or was it just a force of habit? The biggest piece of evidence is the location of the murders. Roughly follow his path to work, except Catherine Eddowes and Elizabeth Stride, but those were both committed on a Sunday, the only day Leechmere would have off of work. Leechmere said he worked at Pickford, but no surviving records have been found to prove this. It is speculated that he did. If he would have worked there, he would be a meat delivery man, so he would be exposed to the slaughter, and now a witness that rose suspicion from the police was Joseph Barnett. Barnett was the man who lived with Mary Jane Kelly up to a few days before she, before the murder. Barnett was employed as a fist porter, but for reasons unknown was fired from his job in August 1888. That entailed the couple to financial issues, and Kelly resorted to prostitution to pay the bills. The suspicion behind him being suspected was that he felt guilty and shameful that that he led Kelly back to prostitution, and that he went on a murder spree in a desperate attempt to scare her off the streets. As previously stated, Barnett disapproved of Kelly's prostitution. It was all speculation. This makes it, this may explain why Kelly was the Ripper's last and most ferocious mutilated victim. But there's one flaw to that statement, because how would he have gotten home and came back? back to Miller's court when no one recognized him. The most important question is how the door was locked behind the killer. According to Barnett, the key had gone missing sometime long ago. So they would reach through the door by reaching they would open the door by reaching through the window. And the door was said to have a catch lock. Now, a catch lock is a lock that locks itself behind whenever it's closed. But the people that favor Barnett as the Ripper say the key was never went missing, and he had it, and he used it the night of the murder. But it's impossible to tell if he ever did lie. The third and final suspect on this list is a name named Francis Tumblety. He was a physician from America who, who two days before the murder of Mary, of Mary Jane Kelly was arrested in London. As you can tell by the picture, Tumblety was a character, to say the least. Tumblety was known for misleading medicines, saying that it could cure from anything from scurvy to blindness to even cancer, using nothing but medicinal herbs. Tumblety was not a good guy in the law's perspective, neither. According, he was accused of theft, assault, and even manslaughter of a patient. Tumblety had also been supposedly expressed hatred of women. On November the 2nd, an account of being suspected of being the Ripper, he was arrested He was arrested on account of being suspected of being the Ripper. But two days later, the, the body of Mary Jane Kelly was found. It is still, it's still unknown if Tumblety was still in custody or he was released on bail. But after he, after he escaped prison, 
after he escaped bail, he escaped Europe in a false name and came back, went back to America to never return to Europe. So to recap, he was a misogynistic me medicine, medicine man who was in London at the time of the murder. He sounds like the perfect subject, suspect, but maybe a little too perfect, though. There was no doubt Tumblety was in London at the time of the murders, but the truth behind how bad he was was written in one article from December 1888 during, during an interview from a man that goes by Charles Dunham. And Dunham had a long history of spreading misinformation. And was distracted and it was described as a pathological liar and a and with a con man. He was even he was even convicted of perjury. As such, there is every reason to not believe a single bit of the story. Furthermore, Tumble T was both tall and older than what the witnesses described the Ripper. As it is hard to imagine a tall American sneaking around Whitechapel undetected. On the other hand, we don't know if any of the witnesses' accounts can be trusted. Then, there is the rings. You may recall the two missing brass rings that were stolen from the body of Annie Chapman. It's suspected that the rings were taken as a trophy by the Ripper upon, upon his death in 1903. Tumble T left behind a quite impressive estate, but within the valuables, there was a pair of inexpensive imitation rings. The question is, are they the same missing from Chapman? It is possible, but it is unfortunately impossible. If the many rumors to be, are to believe, be believed, he had opportunity and motive for the killings. But there's the problem. Most of everything we know about Tumble Team is just rumors. To navigate the mystery of the identity of the Ripper is a minefield of hearsay and contradictions. Entire encyclopedias have been, have been made dedicating the suspects of the identity of the Ripper. Though there are hundreds of suspects, only a dozen or so are even worth a brief consideration. Me, myself, I truthfully believe that Jack the Ripper has not even been identified as a suspect. The three suspects I named are probable candidates, but arguments can still be made against them. And it's still, it's not difficult to imagine one lonely sailor, butcher, medic, merchant, marman, watchman, blending into the slums of white travel, like a grain of sand.